Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. So in this video, I'll be looking to share with you some of the important to-dos and things that you need to know as you're looking to get started in the stock market. I'll be covering a lot of the you know, common questions that a lot of the new beginners have, uh, such as you know what do you need to do first uh, before you even begin? Uh, how do you understand stocks? Uh, risks that you need to be aware of? Uh, how much money do you need? And where do you even start? And after we've gone on to these you know, nitty gritty details and then share with you, you know, some of the you know, uh, industries uh, that I think have a lot of potential from you know, the year 2021 and beyond. So consider sticking around. So if you like some of the contents in this video, please do hit like and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. So we're gonna go deep down into this topic because there is a lot of information, but I'll still be breaking things down into uh, hopefully more digestible sessions and since we're really talking about an important topic here or it's about your money uh, so be, be mindful this could be one of my longer videos so feel free to you know skip around to different parts of uh, any video that uh, you find interesting just one caveat and disclaimer here so you always want to be careful of the information and advice I receive over the internet and YouTube so this guy me included uh, I wish that someone would have told me years ago about the information I'm about to share with you. It probably put me in a much uh, better, better place in terms of investment performance. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, uh, even if you did learn, you know, one or two things or even three things that, you know, from this video that enables you to you know, start your investment journey better, then, you know, that's probably mission accomplished for me. And for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Jason and I'm a Chartered Financial Analyst. Uh, it's a short form for CFA. And if you're not involved in the financial industry, you know what the CFA really is. It's a, a recognized a professional certification uh, for those individuals who choose to go on a path of you know, mental torture where they undergo 900 hours of study um, to take three grueling exams on all things about finance and investment. So I'm one of those uh, individuals. Um, but I think that just gives me a little, little bit more right uh, to share with you about some of my thoughts about the stock market. So a quick look back at last year's stock performance. So I'm not going to be spending too much time talking about this subject, uh, but it does set the scene of uh, what you can sort of expect and keep you informed of what has been happening. So last year, the S&P 500, uh, which is an index uh, that measures the port performance of a basket of the 500 largest US listed stocks, it was up 16%. So compared to the, uh, the year before, which is 2019, uh, it was 31%. So 16% doesn't seem so good, but compared to what actually happened in 2020, I'm sure you've got experience, you know, it's actually quite a phenomenal performance. But if you look deeper, you take away, you know, the largest companies like, you know, Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon, then the S&P 500 performance would be cut in half. So what this really means on a deeper level is that, you know, bigger is getting bigger. Those companies with, you know, robust digital strategies, not even pandemic that threw the whole world off the rails, could even stop them from making money. Now, before, you get too excited and go out there and rush into and invest in those companies. Just remember, past performance really doesn't equal to future performance and there will be volatility. There's still possibility of making losses. And if you're still, you know, watching this video and ready to get started, here are still four things that you should do before you even invest. Before you even begin investing is make sure you pay off your debt. See, the end goal of investing is we want our pool of money to grow. So let's say you invest in a rental property, you rent it out to a tenant, the tenant pays you rent, the rent arrives in your bank, and then your money grows. It's a very, very simple example, but it also works the other way. So when you take on a loan and that charges you interest and you don't pay off that loan, your pool of money keeps on growing smaller as you pay interest out. It's probably very difficult to ask everyone to pay off all their debts immediately. So you wanna be strategic and smart uh, with uh, the debts or loans that you currently have. So start off with seeing what you have and then what is charging you the highest interest. That could be your credit card loans. It could be your personal loans and start off paying those first. Because in the end of the day, investments aren't guaranteed uh, to make a profit or return every single time. But when you pay off those you know, high interest debt first, you're guaranteed to save money and you'll be in a much better position to start investing. So the second thing I recommend is you to have a rainy day fund. So this is basically money that you set aside for three to six months uh, to cover your monthly expenses. This is just in case you, know, you perhaps you know, lose your job or you get sick for a long time, you're not able to work. You just want to have options and you don't want to be forced in a position where you're forced to sell your investments at you know, disadvantaged prices. So the third thing is make sure you don't have any short-term liquidity needs. 
So what this means is there are no foreseeable, you know, large ticket items that you need to pay up very, very soon. So maybe it's like a down payment for a house or maybe some college education that you need to pay up front or even, you know, wedding expenses that can, you know, it's getting more and more expensive. So these uh, large ticket items you want to set aside as well and don't use this in your investment pool. Now the fourth step is to set a plan, make a commitment, so it doesn't matter if it's monthly or yearly, to so start saving money and streaming into that investment account of yours. It also doesn't matter if it's a little money or a lot of money, but make a promise to yourself to not withdraw any money from that investment account because we want to get that snowball rolling for you. So the next step in the process is for you to decide whether you like to invest passively or actively. And by passively, you basically invest in index funds uh, or ETFs and actively is where you choose your own stocks. So both approaches are okay, but perhaps the central question is how much time do you think or you're willing to spend on your investment portfolio and your interest level in reading things as dry as company annual reports and financial news. So there's definitely not such a thing of a passive investing is better or active investing is better. But with active investing, there's just more you know, decisions that you actually need to make from what to invest, you know, how to invest, where to invest, how much to invest, what companies to have in your portfolio, each of the weightings, uh, how much of each shares that you need, and when to buy, when to sell. And for passive investing, uh, those are basically uh, decided for you by a particular fund manager, but you still have some degrees of choices where you actually need to make a decision. For example, uh, how much money you would put in a particular fund, how much fees that you will pay for the fund, obviously the lower the better. And thirdly, uh, about the index strategies or fund strategies that you're willing to buy into. So this could be as simple as do you want to uh, buy you know, a country-wide index that covers uh, a lot of the US companies such as the S&P 500 or something more technology focused like the NASDAQ 100 index and so forth. Another point that's often mentioned about passive investing that's quite important is that you get instant diversification. So what that really is is it's like an insurance policy uh, for your bad bets that you make. So when you invest in a fund, that fund that invests in a basket of different stocks or different companies. And if one company for some reason does bad, goes bankrupt, it's worth zero, then because it's only a small portion inside your whole portfolio, that doesn't create you know, a magnifying effect than having 100% in that company that just went bad. However, you know, just like an insurance is meant to protect you from the downside, no one also you know, got rich from investing in insurance. So when you diversify too much, you also don't get spectacular results because everything also averaged out on the upside. So passive investing is definitely uh, a great choice for those that do not have enough time. I mean, historically, it's been shown that you know, investing in an index like a low-cost S&P fund uh, has outperformed the rate of inflation. So you're basically not just keeping the money in your pocket, but you're earning more money because you're investing passively. So let's move on and talk about stocks. So stocks or shares is essentially partial ownerships of a business. So when you buy a stock, you actually are or becoming a partial owner of the business. But it doesn't mean that you need to be responsible for you know, making the day-to-day -day decisions and need to know everything about the operations. You're buying the stock because you have a positive outlook for that business and you think that share is undervalued. But we'll talk about more of that later in the video. As a stockholder, then you're also entitled to the profits that are paid out by a company to its shareholders. So let's say you own 1% of Google and Google announces that it will pay out $1,000 as dividends to all of its shareholders. So in this $1,000 payout, you are entitled to 1%, so that's $10 and that gets directly deposited into your account. But do note one thing, well two things actually. So one, dividends are taxable and two, dividends are also optional. Optional meaning that companies do not have an obligation to pay out their excess profits to its shareholders. I mean, companies usually can have a lot of reasons why. Uh, one of the most legitimate reasons is, you know, they want to reinvest into their businesses because they see, you know, investing in growth uh, will help the company much more than paying out to its shareholders. So this is actually one legitimate reason why. So generally, companies don't really change um, their dividend policies that often. I mean, they would want to work with increasing dividend policies but changing meaning it's not higher this year like this and then lower this year over here and then another higher again because 
Yes, that's not that popular in the stock market. I mean, we like predictability of earnings to see how much dividends we will, we will receive. Other investors also like predictability and companies actually know it. And when companies actually are able to do this, they attract more investors. That's good for the stock price and also good for the company management. However, that does not mean you go out and try to find the company that pays the highest dividend. There are some companies that pay, you know, 15%, 20%, 30%, even some more than 100% because one, it's not really sustainable. And two, if you think about these companies that pay out all of the cash to shareholders, then how are they going to sustain their own operations? How, where are they going to invest in growth from? So whether or not you want to use a dividend yield as some sort of yardstick or, or measure to say, you know, check, check the box or whether you like to use it to choose companies really depends on you as the investor. Are you the type of investor that really needs this stock dividend income uh, from your portfolio that you maybe it's for your living expenses or the other type of investor where you want to invest in growth that you don't need any dividend income you rather have the company reinvest into it, its business and hope it grows much more uh, five or six or ten years time that's really up to you as the investor so for example like a investor like myself so I'm not too young not too old and I personally don't really pay attention to dividend yields and I well I hope I do still have a you know long horizon a lot of years uh, behind ahead of me or is it behind me I think it's ahead of me so anyways, so I have a lot of years ahead of me, then what a company pays out now, really, it's, it's not that significant and what the company will be worth in 5, 10 or 20 years. So it really depends again on the investor and where you are right now. So how do you really learn more about the business? So you can do it, uh, you know, financially, um, anal analytical, boring way, where you go onto the company's website, you go onto the IR section, which stands for Investor Relations section, and you can look at their annual reports or the 10K forms. So these are uh, reports that the company produces once every year, where it's a big summary of what the company has accomplished over the past year, as well as forecasts or plans what they wanna do in the next couple of years as well. There's also three important statements uh, where many, many investors do pay attention to. The first one is the income statement or the revenue statement. So this basically says uh, how much money that the company has made and how much money that the company has spent. And then there's also a net profit figure. And the second is the balance sheet. So balance sheet is basically a snapshot of what the company owns and what the company owes. And the third statement is what we call the cash flow statement. So this is actually depicts of how much cash is coming in and how much cash is going out. Some companies also uh, present it into like an investor presentation as well, which is also hosted on the website. And then there are also quarterly or even half yearly statements, uh, depending on which market, where they would periodically then give an update instead of the full picture uh, to investors. And But when I usually read these kind of statements, uh, it's always uh, useful to keep like a skeptical, a healthy skepticism, uh, because you know that the company management really only tells you one side of the story or tells you the story that you really want to hear. You know, most people promise that things are going good. I hope they are. I'm not saying that they lie, but there has been, you know, history of companies that, you know, outright fraudulent, they really lie into your face. Uh, but that's what you want to do. So you don't want to take, you know, every word that they say. So one very useful approach, though it's quite time consuming, is as you want to understand a company, don't just read one year, read also the year before, read the year before before, and then read the years, you know, three or four years ago. So you get a better sense or more complete sense of what the company is really doing. So after you've read, you know, multiple financial statements of just one company and over a number of years, you also want to supplement that by, you know, real life experience as in, you know, have you, have you bought the product before? Have you used it before? And have you experienced the service of the company before? There are also some you know, hypothetical questions that you really can ask yourself when you're looking into a company about uh, just to, to gorge about how strong it is. For instance, you know, some can be quite basic. Uh, one would be, what's the likelihood of you uh, recommending this product or service or this company uh, to your friends and family? Uh, two, if uh, let's say the company you know, jacks up its price by 100% uh, tomorrow, are you still going to buy its product? Um, three, you can also try, you know, count how many competitors there are uh, in 
the industry obviously the less the better because um, as an investor as an owner you really want to sell a product where you're the only one in the marketplace uh, that's called a monopoly uh, there are also often bad things uh, people do say that you know it's, it's bad for consumers or whatsoever but when you're an investor you're coming as the owner so obviously you do have different considerations and fourth is uh, let's say you know a, a competitor you know pops up the next day it's very well capitalized money is not an object and it produces a very similar product or services to the company that you're studying at a less price than yours maybe half the price than yours then you as a consumer what would you do are you going to go to that new company or are you going to stick with this one you know, but businesses and you know, stocks they come in all shapes and sizes so there really isn't like a, a list of questions where you can ask each one of them uh, that's appropriate to all of these different businesses uh, so when you're uh, involved in active investing I really encourage you to use the time research to really understand a business before you actually start investing in them after we've talked about you know things to read to understand a company or things to do to understand a company let's talk about risks that you need to know so I've shown seven different risks that will be more relevant to you when you invest in the stock market and I'll go through them with you one by one but I also have not listed all types of risks, things like interest rate risk, solvency risk, because those are just less relevant to you at this moment. But remember, when dealing with risks, your number one job as a stock market investor, when there's a risk situation, is to be a judge, whether the risk that you're dealing with is temporary or permanent. This is important because it forces you to think deeper. Permanent and damaging risk may signal, maybe it's time to sell, since a stock or business can't really overcome these challenges to meet its potential. Temporary risk, on the other hand, may signal that indeed this could be a buying opportunity if the market and other sellers are overreacting. So remember this point. Business risk, it's when uncertainties lead to a loss or less profits for your business or stock investment. So for example, let's say you invested in a coffee shop and the business is doing quite well because everybody is coming to you for coffee in the neighborhood. Then suddenly, there's news and development that Starbucks is circling your block. So competition is an example of risk unique to the business. Though something to remember is that business risks you can diversify away. So by not holding 100% eggs in one basket. So don't invest all your money in this one coffee shop. Market risk is losses because of movements in market prices. For example, let's say you buy gold and the price moves up. So gold is worth more and obviously no one is complaining. But it's the downside risks, downside movements that everyone is scared of the paper losses because of downward prices. Now that's market risk. Do note that most market movements are random, if not temporary. So many downside or upside moves can be ignored. So there's no need to monitor these daily prices. I actually made another video you can check out in the description or link here. It's about, about eight investment mistakes to avoid. But what you should be wary of is if these downward price movements become long-term and permanent. Regulatory risk is when regulations or legislation is a bad change. So laws and rules are also constantly changing. But it's only a risk when it affects your business badly. So no one complains if it's good, like tax cuts. So let's say you run a bakery. Everything is going good, bread is selling, customers are coming back. Then COVID hits, lockdown measures are mandated, social distancing. Then there's no business because government issues stay at home orders. That's regulatory risk. It's good for public health, but bad for your bakery. Liquidity risks. There are many def definitions actually, but two of the more important ones to think about is one, if the business or your investment in fails to meet its short-term debts, you can take it as having not enough cash. So two is on the investor level. So let's say if you want to buy or sell a stock right now, and those buy and sell orders that you put out affects the market prices in a bad way. So that's called illiquidity, or when you're dealing with thinly traded stocks. So. For example, referring to the first point, liquidity risk is quite self-explanatory, the business is drowning, and time is really not on your side. The second example is about thinly traded stocks. So usually these are smaller stocks that have lower trading volume, and I'll talk about volume in the next section, but here's what I mean now. So let's say you want to sell um, your own stock that's thinly traded, means there's not many buyers. So you may have to offer 20% you know, discounts to sell it off, and to attract these buyers, which is already bad already. But let's say, Afterwards, you still have more stock to sell. You may have to lower your price again to attract buyers. And again, to attract buyers. And again, to attract buyers. You get the idea. Exchange rate risks. Now this is quite self-explanatory and can, can be completely avoided if you don't invest in anything that uses foreign currency. 
so you can choose to not invest in stocks listed overseas. But still, it can exist at the business level, at the stock level. So if your business has operations or let's say sales offices abroad, it's just basically a risk if foreign currency moves negatively against your business or your investment. Ratings risk. Now this is most often relevant to when you're investing in investment bonds, but it can also affect your stock performance as well. So here I'm referring to credit rating agencies, you know, those ones that are trusted in the market. And let's say they rate negatively on your invested company. Ratings are almost like the five-star reviews that we're so familiar on the App Store or the Play Store. So the higher the credit rating, the more stars, the cheaper it is for the company to borrow money because they can borrow at a lesser interest rate. So I exaggerate the, the arrow a bit about how erratic these ratings can be. They usually are much smoother and don't jump around too much, but you get the idea. So inflation risks, I put this last. It's just something you have to keep in mind. Inflation always affects your money. It's an invisible tax on your money and my money. The numbers stay the same, but everything else gets more expensive. We lose purchasing power. If we don't invest, we are guaranteed to lose to inflation. And that's usually two to 3% a year. It also eats into business profits because businesses experience inflation as well. So it's useful to think about, you know, can the business that you're thinking about investing on or already invested in keep on par, if not overcome inflation? Or you know, can the business raise prices along with inflation, if not more, without losing customers? Now we've talked a lot about risk. Have you fallen asleep already? So let's move on to talk about some nitty gritty things about the stock market itself. So I'm on the CNBC website and there's a lot of stock market information here. The summary is presented quite clean. It's easy to read if you look at. And we're looking at the Apple stock. So let's uh, talk about some important stock market terms that uh, you could learn. So here's firstly is the opening price. That's basically the price that Apple stock started trading yesterday. And the closing price is the price that Apple stock last traded yesterday. And that's, this is the most important price of the day. Then there's the day low, day high price. Um, it's, it's quite self-explanatory. What well, was the highest price that was last traded for the day and the lowest price. Then there's a 52 week range for that's the whole year. And this um, moves along, obviously, um, as you progress for each trading day. Then there's beta. I usually ignore this, but it just says how sensitive the Apple stock is in terms of the price movements compared to the market. So let's say the market moves 1% then Apple would usually move 1.27% over, over a period of time. So I wouldn't pay attention to this and it varies a lot between stocks. And if you invest for the long term, it really doesn't mean much. The larger the number beta is, it means the stock is just more volatile. Here, then you have the market capitalization. So here it's 2.2 trillion. This is the size of company, this is the size of Apple. So let's say you want to buy all shares of Apple, you want to buy the company, you need at least $2.2 trillion. Then there's shares outstanding. So this is how many shares exist in the market. You multiply this number by the price, which is around $130. Then you get market capitalization. Here you have a dividends. So dividend figure shown here is what has been paid in the last four quarters. This is dividend yield, and which is dividend divided by the price. It gives you an indication of how much dividends you can expect to receive in percentage terms. So if you buy today, you get 0.64%. Uh, but this, again, this is not a guarantee. It's just an indication. And this number will fluctuate as both prices and dividends fluctuate as well. Then you come here, you have um, the earnings per share, EPS. Uh, TTM stands for trading 12 months or the last 12 months. So earnings per share is a very important number. This is Apple's total yearly profit divided by its outstanding shares. So EPS is almost like if you held onto one share, how much earnings you get, not dividends or cash, but earnings you get from Apple stock. So if you think about it if in terms of real estate, you buy a property, you rent it out, it's almost like rental income per square footage. So note this figure is not comparable across companies because the shares outstanding uh, dip, uh, between companies is almost always different. So you can't really compare it across companies. Then you have the price to earnings ratio. So this is a more comparable, but still there are some caveats in, to this. So this is what you usually hear most often talked about in the financial media. It's basically share price divided by earnings per share. It gives you a sense of how much money you pay to get $1 in earnings. So a rule of thumb, the lower the better, the lower the better. 
However, there's nothing that prevents low PE stocks from becoming even lower. And this PE ratio really differs across a lot of different industries and even countries as well. But it helps you give you a sense of what markets are valuing the most. Uh, so some tech companies, um, obviously not Apple here, but some newer upstart tech companies, they have up ratios of 100 or even 200, even 300. And this is just, you can interpret as investors believe those companies have a high potential, even if they don't have earnings right now or very, very little earnings, but investors believe that earnings will come later. Then you have this PE and forward PE. So what the difference is, is this is again tra trailing 12 months, or so last 12 months. NTM stands for next 12 months. And it, this is a dependent on a forecast of earnings uh, by, a number, uh, by a number of different analysts. So uh, that's the difference. So this one is uh, what had happened, and this is what people or what analysts think will happen. Then you have revenue, MRQ. That stands for the most recent quarter. It's self-explanatory. It's basically the amount of revenue or sales that Apple brought in last quarter. So in the previous three months. Now ROE, return on equity, is a very, very important measure. It's about how much uh, profit per dollar of equity. So equity is a term for the funding um, by its owner. So it's money that was contributed to Apple over the years and does not need to be repaid. It's like the money you contribute to your mortgage. You know, equity increases every time you pay the principal. So all things equal, the higher the ROE, the better. But you also need to take into account um, how much money did the company borrow? Because the more debt, the more company borrows more money, this number will go higher. Still, you definitely prefer businesses with a high ROE than low. And you want to see an increasing ROE in a yearly trend, so over, over, the, over the years. Then there is debt to equity. So this is a ratio between how much debt to equity uh, the company has. So there's no rule of thumb here, but normally too high, let's say I figure out with 200% or 300%, you should try to understand why. So maybe it's just because it's a business need. So let's say it's a business you know, that needs to borrow to build things. Let's say it's like constructing buildings or infrastructure. So debt will need to be borrowed first before the business can actually do business. Because without a building, you can't really do anything for uh, the, the investors that have buildings. But now interest rates are quite low. So businesses do have more wriggle room on debt because um, interest expenses are low. Then there's EBITDA. So this stands for earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. I usually um, it's, don't really look at this, but many other investors do. So this is an approximation for cash flow uh, to the business, so cash coming in, but it's um, very, very imperfect. I hope the financial concepts in this video is helpful to you uh, to start your investment journey. Maybe one of the, you know, a few remaining questions that you have is, you know, how many stocks uh, should you invest? Some, some typical answers would tell you you should invest 30, 40, 50, 80, or as much as possible. But I don't think that's a really good idea because remember, once you invest in a company, you really do need to monitor it. So do you really have time to really monitor, you know, 80 companies, so that's 80 financial statements, 80 different quarterly reports and so forth. So I don't think that's really uh, practical. So I think in terms of getting the benefits of diversification, but also having enough time to monitor the companies, plus that that you don't dilute any of the you know, really great outperformance that you do choose um, eventually, is you shouldn't really go above 20. And the sweet spot would be between 10 to 20. So 10 being a very, very concentrated portfolio and 20 being there's probably not much point to further diversifying or gaining anything other than that uh, once you get above 20. So 10 to 20 is probably the spot that you want to be. So how much money to get started? Well, I think there's a simple answer and a smarter answer. So I'll start with the simple answer is it really just takes as much as you know, the, uh, the, the price of the stock that you're willing to buy. So if it's one share at $10, then all you need really need is $10, especially on those platforms and brokers where I really don't charge any commissions or fees. Uh, but the smarter answer is, and something that I wish someone told me earlier was, put money in the stock market up to a level where it really doesn't affect your sleep. Because remember, you're here to play the long game. So you really want to sleep well, you don't want to have those mood swings, and you want to be focused, objective, logical. So how do you start buying stock? You know, where to buy? You know, the first prerequisite is uh, you, first of all, you do need a, a bank account because um, that's really where, you know, money comes in. You know, you can't really pay cash to, to buy stocks. I, I don't think you can. Well, I've never tried, you know, using cash to buy stocks. So, you know, feel free to prove me wrong. Uh, if you have, you know, do let me know in, in the comments below. 
So the next step is setting an account with a stockbroker. For here, I don't think there's really any need for a uh, special consideration or spending too much time into selecting one. So the general recommendation is, is definitely choose the lowest cost provider available in your country. It's very easy. You just Google it because the money that you spend with a stockbroker is usually things that you don't really, really see or feel. So do try to keep those costs down and that's definitely will be positive uh, for your investment performance over the long term. So now we're at the point where the rubber meets the road. You've learned a couple of financial concepts in this video. You're determined to invest for the long term. You're committed also to keep learning to in improve your uh, investment performance. But remember that we also need to um, set some expectations. Uh, stock market is a place where a lot of people make money. But for those people who do it wrong, a lot of people also lose money. So it's also go back to the point where you don't really ever want to lose your sleep just because of uh, what the stock market is doing. So start small, start now, and see you at the top. So this is the bonus section where I said earlier in the video, I'll be sharing with you, you know, some of the uh, outlooks or industries that I believe, you know, have a really good uh, investment potential from 2021 and beyond. And um, so the, the industry that I'm paying attention to is the green energy sector or clean energy sector. So here's why, and I believe there's a couple of catalysts, but to just take things into context. I'm not sure when you're going to be watching this video. So right now I'm in 2021 January. So just take into the context. Uh, but anyways, so President Biden, I think, is a very, very big catalyst um, to instigate, you know, a new round of change and accelerate the change in green investments. So one, he's going to rejoin the Paris uh, Climate Accords. Um, he's going to invest two trillion dollars into clean energy. Uh, you know, whether you know Congress does approve it, that's another story. But that's, it's, it's, I think, it's quite likely. But what I believe more will happen is by the public sector taking this uh, lead, I think it will also. Uh, release a lot of uh, private money into the sector as well. He also wants to decarbonize the power sector by 2035. And I think just by, you know, having this new competition just within the, the domestic economy, uh, you will also instigate, you know, international competition in Europe and China as well. So particular sectors that I think have a lot of promises include, you know, new innovations in batteries, because they're widely applicable in the growing electric vehicle sector, hydrogen, as well as, you know, already current leaders inside uh, the green energy sector. And uh, if you look at uh, in 2020, a lot of the uh, clean energy related stocks, whether in solar and wind, they have, have already um, increased quite a lot in just 2020. So not even really the pandemic could really uh, affect their performance. Because if you think about it, you know, 2020, uh, a lot of people were forced to work at home. A lot of people were forced to school at home as well. Uh, so some parts of the energy sector like you know crude oil gasoline you know those are really affected because people you know greatly reduced how much they actually drove so but whether this actually uh, you know uh, does change or picks up back in the future we'll still have to see but clean energy production itself it doesn't seem to be just a one-year thing it seems to be in a multi-year uh, investment kind of structural change so it's going to be something that's um, prolonged from 2021 and beyond and there are certain themes where I think um, things aren't really going to change as much. So in, for instance, you know, low interest rates, they seem they're going to be, you know, here for some time, maybe next three or four years. And that really affects the stock market. So the lower the interest rates is, the better it is for the stock market. And then the themes of, you know, bigger companies are getting bigger. So this would also be equally applied to um, the leaders in the green energy sector right now. So I expect them to get bigger as they, you know, a bit, uh, 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 could be, you know, producing uh, more and more cheaper than the competitors. So they're likely to be the beneficiaries and then the richer are getting, uh, getting richer. So definitely, and if you think about it, uh, a lot of the times, you know, it's, it's quite human nature where, you know, when you have a deadline and then you actually do most of the work when you're closer, as you get closer to the deadline. So this is quite something like the Paris Climate Accord as well, where, you know, countries have signed on where they've um, said, you know, a particular year, I need to be carbon neutral, I need to be doing so forth. But as the deadline gets closer, I believe more money will be thrown into the sector just to um, meet this kind of um, uh, requirement that they set themselves. So. Uh, so, so definitely, I think that you know this is definitely uh, industry where uh, you need to pay attention to, and definitely I will need to, I will pay attention to as well.